adults go down there. A uh, great weekend. You got to see some of the campground there with that drone footage. Uh, it was a great time. Uh, I have a big personal announcement to share with you guys. Uh, some big news. Um, and I, I thought this was finally the Sunday to let you know. I have changed my NFL allegiance. Um, I have formally renounced the Detroit Lions, and in doing so, my wife told me, she is a big Bronco fan, that I had to then convert to the family team of the Broncos. So just needed you all to be aware of that. I thought orange looked pretty good on me this morning. <laughs> Reds, but you guys do red and yellow together, though. <laughs> <laughs> I knew that would get you all this morning. Actually, the reason I wanted to announce that this Sunday uh, is because it, Denver cannot lose this weekend because they're on by. <laughs> so no mouth it off. <laughs> hey, uh, a couple of announcements for you that are actual, real, serious announcements. Um, as a church, we're doing an event for our 4th through 12th graders uh, called the a Nativity Escape Room. Uh, if you know the escape room concept, uh, Aaron, our children's director, has combined the two of a, doing a Christmas nativity and a, an escape room. It's, a, it's an awesome idea. I'm really excited for it. Unfortunately, my kids are not quite old enough. It's for the 4th through 12th grade. Space is limited, so we ask that you sign up ahead of time. Dinner will be provided. It's Friday night, December 3rd, from approximately 6 to 8, depending on if they escape or not. Uh, so that, please sign up ahead of time uh, as space is limited. Uh, this Tuesday night is our community-wide Thanksgiving service. It takes place at 7 p.m. and the different area churches all come together. And this is our church's year to host. Uh, but it'll be at the 212 building, the offices right there in town, 131 Main Street, uh, right as, on that curve as you come around the corner in Mound City. Uh, and that's Tuesday night at 7 p.m. Uh, and it'll run 45 minutes to an hour. So uh, I would direct your attention over to the side of the stage over here. Uh, you will notice not only is the cross filled up, but there are extra boxes sitting on the ground. Uh, yes, a big round of applause. The last time I received a count, uh, the count was at 229 boxes. And I know probably more came in Saturday and Sunday from our congregation. Uh, this, there will be open. Our church is a collection point. Uh, the offices in town there is a collection point. So if you hadn't had a chance yet to do a box or if your box is at home, this afternoon, I believe from 1 to 3 is a drop-off time. And then tomorrow morning from like 9 to 10 or something like that because we take the boxes up to Paola for the regional drop-off location. So you have a two last chances if you had not gotten in on this. So uh, a big thank you to everybody who invested some time and money and energy into making uh, our challenge a success, as well as just giving the love of Jesus to some kids uh, around the world. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Caleb, very much. The report I got yesterday was 244 boxes which is exactly 100 more than our previous record. So uh, 100 more, I think that is awesome. You guys, thank God for that and your efforts. And um, the, it just looks cool, that cross. Um, hey, a couple of prayer concerns. First of all, I should pray for all of you and your lack of love and compassion for Caleb because he <laughs> clearly is a very needy person today to wear that orange color. It looked bad on him. It looked terrible. And I expected more compassion out of all of than that for a, for a guy as troubled as he is. <laughs> now, a couple things. Uh, one, uh, it was some weeks ago that we asked prayer for little Ainsley Allen, daughter of Ashley and Austin Allen. Ainsley had hip surgery. She was discovered um, to have hip dysplasia. And actually, they extended, they added some into her hip area to make her legs the same length. Poor girl, for six weeks now, has been in a cast from essentially her ankles to her waist. And uh, she turns two in a couple of weeks. That's how old she is. 
and she gets the cast off in a couple weeks. But she's making progress, and she's figured out how to roll over uh, with that cast, and she's getting, uh, I think, enough rest anyway. Pray for her mom and dad, some patience as they continue to uh, care for her in her uh, situation. It's a pink cast, um, she's, uh, but it's a challenging situation for them. And they wanted people to know that have been praying that she's doing well, making good progress. Uh, also, I'd ask you to pray for Bobby Shoemaker. Bobby had shoulder replacement surgery on Wednesday and is really struggling to recover from that. Uh, they moved him from a, this morning moved, uh, he went from a rehab center this morning to the ER uh, for some struggles. And so please be praying uh, for him uh, that he can uh, come through this thing fine. So would you please open your Bibles? It's the first few chapters in Genesis where we're focusing our study these weeks. Let's say that you're at lunch on Thursday. There's an occasion Thursday and you're having lunch with some family, an extended family, and you're with people that you don't necessarily spend a lot of time with. You don't see that often. And so you're uh, you know, having conversation and how was last weekend and what is it that you do with your time. And everybody weighs in and your comments include that you went to church the past Sunday or you might have been talking about some uh, topic that happened at church and somebody in the room says uh, I can be good without going to church I don't need God in my life in order to be good in fact I know lots of good people that don't worry at all about God and then it just hangs there the awkward 10 seconds of silence you want to say something you don't want to leave that hanging you want to address it as well but you also know some good people that aren't followers of God. In fact, you know some atheists. You'd probably live, rather have them as neighbors than some Christians that you know. And so you're like, man, I might agree. I don't know. I don't know quite what to say. So let me offer you some questions to break down some barriers or to advance the conversation. And each week, as we've offered suggestions, we have. Um, these aren't the, like, this isn't the destination. These are moving the conversation to next steps. And so here would be a couple of things. Um, hey, just to clarify, you're saying that morality isn't dependent on God, that morals, right and wrong, aren't dependent on God. Um, how do you know that something is right or wrong? If somebody's good without God, how do you know that they're being good? How are we even going to define that? What motivates somebody to be good to others if they don't have God in their life? What is it about other people that would motivate someone to be good to them? What compels you to be nice to people when you don't have to be? Why are some people good and some people not so good? Just questions to advance the conversation. You see, these questions reveal a worldview. Everybody has a worldview, a filter through which they look at things and events that are happening in our world. Our series is called Worldview, and we're going to the first pages of the Bible to lay a spiritual foundation to get an understanding of what a biblical worldview really means. Now today we're going to talk about the subject of broken and beautiful, beautiful and broken a description of human nature that draws from the biblical worldview now back in september we did a message called the image of god and it was wonderful to celebrate humanity and how god made people as the pinnacle of his creation since then we've looked at mankind's fall into sin and then the implications of that fall into sin for men and for women what it means for them Today we're going to go deeper into the explanation of human nature as the Bible describes it. And what we're going to discover is that the worldview that the Bible presents is the most cohesive, coherent, logical explanation for the reality that we see around us and within us. The Bible, it makes the most sense. 
Humanity is beautiful, made in the image of God and capable of some great and noble heroics and courageous efforts. And humanity is broken, marred by sin and all of its consequences, given over to selfishness and violence and in evil. So I want to introduce Adam and then Eve. So when we think about Adam and the Bible introduces Adam to us, the word Adam means man or it means human. It's a description or a title first. And the words seem to get used interchangeably between the description, God made man, and then the name. He called him Adam. Now some translations uh, use the word mankind in some effort to be sensitive to women. God uses the word Adam here in talking about man, and he uses it in relation to mankind. He uses it in relation to man as distinct from woman. In Genesis 2 and verse 22, for example, then the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, that's the Hebrew word for Adam, Adam, he made into a woman and he brought her to the man, to Adam. So the word man and the word Adam get used almost interchangeably here in the first few chapters. Kind of distinct. In chapter 5 of Genesis in verse 2, it says, God created them male and female and he blessed them and he called them mankind. That's the word Adam again. He called them Adam in the day that they were created. So Adam is the first character that we have introduced to us. The next one is Eve, of course. The word Eve means life, life giver, the one who brings life. Now something interesting that I haven't quite figured out yet, at the time that she was formed in chapter 2, Take a look at what Adam calls her. Chapter 2 and verse 23. It says there, Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. So Adam names her. There's something fascinating about Adam giving naming rights to the animals and then to woman. But chapter 3 and it's in verse 20. This is what it says. And Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. And so he, name changes occur in the Bible. Abram to Abraham, uh, Cephas to Peter. Name changes happen. And here Adam seems to have changed her name from woman to Eve, life giver. And I don't have that figured out exactly, but I thought that was an interesting observation uh, for sure. So we are introduced to Adam and Eve. Why were they created? Why did God create Adam and Eve? Humanity, people. And people often ask, well, why would God create people if he knew they were going to sin, if he knew they were going to mess up? Why did God make people? Now, the first thing we would want to say is God did not create people because he was lonely. He didn't need somebody to love. He didn't need somebody to love him. And he was lonely. And if we just had some people around. That could give me the attention and the glory. Then I would you know, be secure and satisfied in my identity. That wasn't God at all. In fact we could say this. God was in perfect love and harmony and fellowship. Within the Trinity. Long before creation. God was in perfect fellowship, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And they were together, communing in fellowship with one another. John 17 and verse 5 is a great prayer of Jesus to the Father at the end of the Last Supper. And in that scripture he says, And now, Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world began. So long before the world began, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit were in this perfect, harmonious relationship. But many of you parents know that 
you're overflowing with love and you want somebody to share that with. And God's overflow of love led to the creation of humanity. His overflow of love. There's, it's hard to contain love when you've got uh, compassion, empathy, concern. It's hard to hold that in. And that's exactly what was going on here. In 1 John chapter 4 and verse 10, it says, In this is love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation, the atonement, the covering for our sin. You see, God was overflowing with love. It was spilling out. It was running over. And He created humanity to be recipients of that love. But if he's going to create humanity to be recipients of that love, then he's got to draw our attention somewhere in some direction. So we would add, third, that God created us for his glory. God created us for his glory. Now, where else is God going to draw our attention? If somebody we knew was trying to get all the glory and the attention, he just wants the limelight on him, he just wants all the attention, we would be disgusted by that. But when God says, I created humanity for my glory, somehow it's different. And it's different because nobody, when we see somebody else and they want the glory and the attention, well, somebody's always... Bigger, faster, stronger, smarter. And for God, there's nobody bigger, faster, stronger, smarter. When he draws attention to himself, when he tells us to glorify him, what he's saying is, I don't want you to look to lesser things. I'm calling your attention to that which truly matters to myself. It's in Isaiah 43 and verse 7, where the scripture says... Everybody who is called by my name, whom I have created for my glory, I've formed him. Yes, I've made him. Now this fact guarantees that our lives are significant because we have a purpose to life. We're not just randomly put here and then we've got to wander about trying to make up whatever it is our purpose is. God put us on planet Earth for his glory, to draw our attention to him, to draw our attention to that which is eternal, which really lasts. That gives our lives significance. In Psalm 73, verse 25 and 26, Whom have I in heaven but you? There's none upon earth that I desire beside you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Things may not be working out. I might be running out of gas, but I'm going to hang on to God as the focal point of my life, as my portion. Psalm 84 and verse 1 and 2. How lovely is your tabernacle, your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. My soul longs, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. The point being that God designed us to know Him, and our hearts will be restless and unsettled when we're building our life on anything other than God. It's who we were designed for. It's the direction our lives were designed to focus. And until we find that, there will be an unease, an insecurity, an insignificance, a wandering. When we build our life on anything other than God. So God created humanity in his image. This fact means... That man is like God in so many ways and represents God on planet Earth. Genesis 1 and verse 26 says that God created humanity in his image and in his likeness. It says this in verse 26 of Genesis 1. 
Let us make man in our image, in our likeness. Let him have dominion over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over the cattle, over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Image and likeness. The word image and the word likeness there means something that is similar but not identical. God said, we're going to make something similar but not identical. It was in September in that image of God message that we said that the image of God doesn't mean one thing and it means three other things. It doesn't mean a physical likeness. When we think about the physicality of people, that's not something for us to necessarily attribute to God. But God does contain a mental likeness and he created people with a mental likeness. The ability to think, to know, to learn. A capacity to be self-aware. The cattle out in the pasture aren't contemplating the meaning of life. When I go past every morning the butcher block in Mount City and I watch those uh, cattle and hear the hogs squawking for their last minutes of life, they're not contemplating the meaning of life and they're not turning over why was I born and is this what all my life is you know, up for. Human beings are very different than that. We have this mental likeness to God. Another likeness is a moral likeness, a sense of right and wrong. People can weigh the good and the bad make choices. We are free moral agents. And we have a, a social likeness. Relational connection. We're made to connect with God and others. It's in our design from the beginning. And so here's this humanity made in the image of God. God's likeness. God's image. Humanity is capable of unbelievable good and great sacrifice. Last week, we recognized veterans that were willing to sacrifice their lives for a nation, for a cause, for the guy next to them, for freedom. The things that humanity is capable of because they're made in the image of God and the inventions and the discoveries and the courage but tragically, as we've studied in looking at this image of God, Adam and Eve ate that forbidden fruit. They succumbed to the temptation of the, the opposer. And there is this other side where the sin nature distorts the image of God. It's now flawed. There's something broken and you look out across humanity... And it's clear, something is broken. Something's not working here. How can be, there be this kind of evil? How can the human race be capable of something so wonderful and something so evil? And sometimes it's the same person. The biblical worldview is the only coherent explanation for what we witness in our world and what we witness inside of us. Because we look inside of us and we say how could I have thought that how many times have you said how could I have done that that's not me why would I have done such a thing because the human race is both beautiful and broken how could I do this such a good and noble deed and how could I do this and be so difficult and cruel and evil and wrong Only biblical truth makes sense of what we see in humanity and what we see in our own hearts. Now you might wonder, does humanity continue to retain the image of God? And we do, but that image is marred. In Ecclesiastes chapter 7 is a fascinating little nugget tucked in there. Chapter 7 and verse 29 Truly this only I have found, that God made man upright, 
but they have sought out many schemes. The beautiful and the broken. And with sin, it's not just behavior. Parents, you're not just trying to change behavior. That's certainly a big, important part of parenting. But it goes deeper than that. There's something in the heart of each individual. That's at the core. Our moral purity has been lost and our intellect is corrupted by falsehood and our speech is now critical and profane and distorted. Our relationships are controlled by selfishness instead of love and selflessness. And after the fall, we still have God's image in us, that mental likeness, but it's distorted. We still have the social likeness, but our selfishness disrupts those relationships. We still have the moral likeness, but we're making more immoral choices as the human race. And so the evils of society and culture rise to the surface. Whether it's racism or sex trafficking or violence, social media only makes it worse. It seems as if the more concentrated the humanity, the more concentrated the sin. Because flawed individuals get together with flawed individuals. In fact, the more concentrated, just have one sinning individual marry another sinning individual. And now you've concentrated two sinners in one household. And what happens then? gets a little more focused it gets a little more concentrated and the core the sin nature gets exposed and peeled back now our culture looks at this brokenness that we see around us and has some explanations one explanation that our culture loves to say is biology is the cause I can't help it I was born this way it's just the way I am evolutionary naturalism that says there's no spiritual dimension, only what you can see and feel and touch and measure. We are just chemical reactions. It's just how you're made. It's how you're wired. There's others that would say society is the cause. The system is rigged. The system is broken. The system has failed them. And if we could just throw away the system and somehow invent a new system, if we could find a new system that was more fair, then everybody would be happy and everybody would be fixed. But any system is going to be built by people who are sinners at the core. And so the best systems are going to have checks and balances against the sinful core nature of humanity. But there are some that are putting all of their faith in society as it fault. If we could change the systems. There's others that would say nobody is to blame. There is no right and wrong. Everybody's just, hey, whatever's right for you. You do your thing. I'll do mine. And we're all going to be good. Now, quite truthfully, nobody believes that when you're doing wrong to them. I can say, hey, whatever's right for you, you just do it. And then... When you assault me, suddenly I don't believe that anymore because what you've done has hurt me. But there's plenty that say that in an effort to not, when they think they're not getting harmed by it all. Only the Bible accurately describes the beautiful and the broken. Not only does the Bible describe the beautiful and the broken, the Bible presents the remedy, the cure, the solution. It provides us the redemption of Jesus Christ, where we're now in the process of recovering the sin, uh, the image of God, and doing something about the sin that's at the core. You see, just to revise the system, throw out the system, revise the system, change this hasn't changed humanity at its core. Only Jesus Christ and his death and resurrection addresses the core issue of sin. When Christ came on the scene, now we can begin to track 
and we get into the New Testament and we begin to see descriptions like in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 10 where he says, you have put on the new man who's renewed in knowledge and he's made in the image of him who created him. You see, when a person finds Jesus Christ in their life, now they have God's power and God's capacity to begin restoring the broken image of God that's at their core. We can't expect lost people to act like saved people. They're lost. And as we grow in our understanding of God and His Word and the world around us, we begin to think more and more of the thoughts of God. That's where we're renewed in knowledge as God desires for us to be renewed in the image of His Son. Romans chapter 8 and verse 28. We know that all things work together for good for those who are called according to His purpose. But look how verse 29 goes on to say it. For whom He foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son. That Christ, he might be the firstborn among many brethren. That he'd be the leader of all of these restored people. You see, when God looked down at humanity and he said, Here's, we're going to make him in the image of God. But that image is flawed and distorted by the sin of humanity. And from the beginning, God intended to do something about it. In 1 Peter Chapter 1, and I didn't get this scripture on the screen for you. It's around verse 19. It says that we were redeemed by the lamb who was shed. Here's the key phrase. His blood was shed before the foundation of the world. Before the foundation of the world. Adam and Eve's sin did not take God by surprise. It wasn't like, Oh no, what are we going to do? Father to Son to Spirit. We got a big problem down there. They ate the fruit. We didn't plan on that contingency. Before the foundation of the world, God had already planned a remedy. Max Lucado, in one of his uh, writings, was trying to help us envision that. And it was God making day one, the sun, you know, the, the light, and day two, uh, water and atmosphere, day three, and walking through. And he got to forming the man, and he was ready to breathe into his nostrils the breath of life. And the father, in, in Lucado's imagery, the father looked at the son, and he said, are you ready? Because he's about to blow into his nostrils the breath of life. And he says, are you ready? Because when I blow, you die. Are you ready? It's been God's plan from the beginning that when Christ came, that for God's peop for people to seek Him and become God's people so that the image of God could be restored. It's a process the New Testament calls sanctification. It's a process of holiness where God is making me less angry and more patient. Where God is making me more loving and less selfish. Where God's making me more honest and trustworthy and less dishonest. We're all in that process of learning to become spiritually mature. Where God's refining us and making us in the desert, in the fire, what that third song was that we sang today. Whatever the circumstances, those hardships and difficulties are for God to build into us love and joy and peace, patience, holiness, the process of restoring the image of God. That's where you and I are. As followers of Christ, we're in that process. And if there's not been a time in your life where you put your faith in Jesus Christ, God wants to restore, begin the restoration process of the, His image in your life. One more step in this process. And that's at Christ's return. When Christ returns and takes His people to heaven, 
there will be complete restoration of the image of God. You probably have a character flaw or two or three that really bugs you that it keeps coming up. Why do I keep getting angry? Why am, do I, am I so selfish? Why do I keep saying the things that I say? Imagine the day. So often we think about heaven and the sore leg won't be sore anymore and the sore shoulder won't be sore anymore and you know all the hair will be there and it'll be the right color and all that. But how about the part of heaven where we don't get angry selfishly anymore? How about the part of heaven where we're honest all the time? How about the part of heaven where we have no fears or insecurities? How about the part of heaven where we have no worries? I think that part of heaven is going to be a bigger deal than having our hair back in the right color or having our leg work the way it ought to work. Imagine not worrying about silly things anymore. Imagine not being afraid and insecure anymore. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the whole chapter is about the resurrection, the coming of Christ. Listen to this text, verse 49. As we have borne or carried the image of the man of dust, right, that's Adam, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. Someday, when we get to heaven, there will be complete restoration of the image of God. One day. Now the full measure of the image of God is not seen in humanity today, but one day. We've started in the first page or two of the Bible. I want to take you to the very last chapter of the Bible, so that would be the last page, Revelation 22. And there's a few scriptures there I want you to see in a text, verses 1 through 5. Revelation 22. And it's verses 1 through 5. If you would turn there. The very end. The end of the book. The scripture says this. And he showed me a pure river of the water of life. Clear as crystal proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of its street and on either side of the river was the tree of life. Which bore twelve fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. Do you see imagery from the Garden of Eden here? At the Garden of Eden there were rivers flowing. And there was the tree of life. And the leaves of this tree were for the healing of the nations. Verse 3. And there shall be no more curse. The curse on the woman for relational frustration so that it relationships don't satisfy and she turns to God. And the curse that the man has to deal with vocational frustration, thorns and thistles, so that whatever he puts his mind to, frustrates him just enough. It never stays fixed. It never stays painted. Just so that we'll turn to God and build our lives on him and not on temporary, temporal, short-lived things. And someday, Revelation 22, the last page of the book, there will be no more curse. But the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. Verse 4. They shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. Verse 5. There shall be no night there. They need no lamp, nor light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light. And they shall reign forever and ever. And in the words of the old song, O Lord, haste the day when my faith shall be sight no physical decay no moral decay no relational decay no power of sin no penalty of sin 
Humanity was the culmination of God's creation. And humanity is the culmination of God's work of redemption. Every single human being is made in the image of God. The unborn, the elderly, the vulnerable, the limited, the different than us. No matter how marred the image of God, every human being maintains the image of God. And when we deny humanity's image-bearing nature, then we begin to depreciate the value of human life and we see humans as only higher forms of animals and we lose some of our sense of meaning. But track with me here the path of humanity because it's really our path created in the image of God fall into sin that affects more than just our behavior it's at the core of our nature but the redemption of Jesus Christ when he died on the cross allows us to make our way back and begin the process of having the image of God restored and then our ultimate restoration one day in heaven When those debilitating sins are no more. And we find absolute peace, our ultimate purpose. As it said, his servants shall serve him. But it begins by admitting that we're sinners. And we claim Christ's death on the cross for our sin. And so I would ask if you would to bow your heads please and close your eyes. As each one with heads bowed and eyes closed, has there ever been a time when you asked Jesus Christ to be your Savior? When you put your faith in Christ and you said, I admit that I'm a sinner. Christ has not been first place in my life. But today I acknowledge, I believe Jesus died for my sins. And I confessed Christ as Lord and boss of my life. I don't want you to wander anymore. I want you to get in on the God's restoration process. When you look at your own life and the sin and the mistakes and where our sin takes us and the consequences we end up living with, allow God to forgive those and get on the path of redemption, restoration with the Lord. Being confident that your home is in heaven. Did you pray that way this morning? You'd never done that before, but you prayed today to confess Jesus Christ as Lord. I'd sure love to talk with you about that and help you take that further. There's a connection form in the seat pocket in front of you. And if you fill that out, drop that in the offering basket. I sure want to talk with you about that. Don't go another day without making sure that you're saved. The image of God, beautiful and broken, only the scripture adequately explains what we see in the world around us. God in heaven. I thank you that the scriptures begin and end explaining the world around us. Other worldviews, other messages that we hear fall flat. They don't explain adequately in a cohesive way what we see. And the most important place for us to look is within our own hearts because God, we look within and we see the beautiful and the broken. I thank you for the redemption of Christ. I thank you that this starts a process of restoring the image of God. Thank you for the gospel and its power to change a life at its core. In Jesus' name, amen.
Amen. Let's stand together, please. Uh, we do not have...